this, this uh, subject is oversubscribed, this lecture hall is meant to be full, and it's like half full. So, you know, week two, that's a pretty sharp drop off. If we keep doing that, there'll be like six people in the front row I can talk to. It'll be, um, the <laughs> final lectures will be very intimate. Um, if you are a WebStream student and you did that because you have a clash on Wednesday, but you can make the Tuesday lecture, feel free to come on in, bulk up the numbers. I've got seven chocolates here. No, I've got chocolates, so there might be a um, chance of you getting chocolate as well. Uh, so feel free to come in. Thanks for participating in the lecture, though. I, I appreciate your presence. I like the back and forth conversation. It has value for me, even if it doesn't have value for you. Um, I should apologize for getting the lecture slides out late. Um, I had three days sick last week. That's just crazy for week one. Um, I'm, I just, yeah, I don't even know how Dr. Kellerman's gonna do it because he's been sick for more than that. Um, so I will try and get further ahead um, this week and so next week looks more organized. Cool, I might talk for a little while and if you're here and you're talking, talk about thermodynamics and speak loud enough for me to hear you. Um, thanks guys, thanks for that. Um, excellent, cool, so over the next two hours, We'll talk a little bit about um, Wednesday, in case you, you missed it, you forgot what uh, Wednesday was all about. We finished our lecture on Wednesday on the first law of thermodynamics, so I want to continue that and do a second treatment of the, the first law of thermodynamics, specifically for closed systems. And then that's going to introduce some terms we want to formally talk about and define, specifically heat and work. Uh, we need to talk about heat capacity and heat capacity introduces a term we haven't seen before, enthalpy, okay? That's on 24, so that's not a spelling mistake. That's a property of a substance that we haven't come across before and we want to formally define internal energy as well. And then depending on how time goes, we'll talk a little bit about pressure, why we have atmospheric pressure and um, some of our concerns with pressure as well. So that's my, my thinking. I don't know whether it's gonna go long or short. We'll just play this as it goes. If I start talking really slowly in the last half hour, you know, I've run out of material, I'm just trying to eke it out. No, if we run out of material, we'll cut the lecture short and we'll, um, we'll go home. Um, not me, I have to work on tomorrow's lecture content. So that's what I plan on covering today. Um, and we've got some worked examples as well. So yesterday, on Wednesday, uh, we finished off the ideal gases and particularly the combined gas law. We came in with PV divided by T at state one equals PV divided by T at state two if the substance doesn't change and the mass is constant as well. So PV equals MRT, you can take the T across the other side. So we, we finished on that. And then we showed a pressure, specific volume and temperature, three dimensional chart and projected that back onto two dimensions in three different ways to show that you can get a relationship. Once you know P and V, you can know T and so forth. We introduced some terms. So phase being whether something's a solid, liquid or gas. Um, the idea that processes follow a path and that a cycle is where you have a fluid that returns to the state, its original state, at the end um, of a, a series of processes. So we're gonna mention cycles again. Cycles will become what the subject becomes about later on, about halfway through. We pretty much talk about cycles from then on. So we're introducing them and their relevance, um, but we won't study them until later. And then we finished off with an introduction to the first law of thermodynamics. Um, there were two key tenets for the first law of thermodynamics. Anyone remember from Wednesday? No. It's fine, go. Conservation of mass and energy. They're the two key tenets of the first law of thermodynamics. We're going to start with those. I want to clarify something. Thanks for asking questions after class. Um, I also like it when you ask questions during class 
But when people come up after class and they're like, hey, what does this mean? I'm like, ah, oh, I didn't teach it well, or I didn't emphasize it enough. So I just wanted to point out in concept 14, we talked about thermodynamic processes for ideal gases. The words on the left, which we introduced, so there's six new words for us. The words on the left mean the things in the middle column. Adiabatic means there's no heat. Heat um, transfer is zero. Okay. Specifically when applied to ideal gases, because PV equals MRT, when we're talking about ideal gases, specifically applied to ideal gases, the things on the right are true for ideal gases. So just to make it clear, if you compress steam isobarically, for example, you won't get a relationship that V on T will be constant because steam is not an ideal gas. Steam for us is a pure substance. So I just wanted to, I, I didn't have it in purple before. I just wanted to emphasize. So this is true for the working fluid we're talking about now, which is ideal gases. Next week I introduce pure substances and these things aren't true for pure substances. We have to do different, um, consider things differently. But for ideal gases, these things hold true. Um, there's some questions about what K is. I'll define K today. Um, so that should help. Good, good. So yeah, love questions and, and just, oh, when you said this, well, you know, um, please do clarify. Good question. Do we have to know the complete equation for the first order thermodynamics? Yes. But we get exposed to it like four times. So you've had one treatment, I'll treat it three more times for a total of four. Um, and it will seem very intuitive later. <laughs> it's a long formula. Um, and then for every problem, we just uh, simplify it down to the things we need. But I think you need the full formula. As when you're doing engineering, you're always making simplifications on anything you do. So you, you, in solid mechanics, you say, well, let's use steel. Let's say it's got a yield stress of 350, 250 megapascals. That's a gross simplification on what's actually happening, but it's a simplification that you make. And you need to be aware of the simplifications you're making. So you say, yes, I'm making this simplification and I know what it is and what the sensitivity of the problem is to the simplifications I've made. So it's good to know what you're cancelling out. Good question. Good, good. We'll get there. Cool. So, so this is first law of closed systems. So did introduction to the first law of thermodynamics. This is then the first law for closed systems. And we've got our box down the bottom. And I've closed off the, the inlets and the outlets. Inlets closed. Outlets closed. And so there's no mass in and no mass out. But we see we can still have work occur on the system and we can still have heat flow across the boundary for the system. Okay, so now we just go pair it right back, make it simple. Excellent. Conservation laws, thank you, were the conservation of mass. The mass is neither created nor destroyed and energy is neither created nor destroyed. This is the first law of thermodynamics um, and we come back to it, but may change forms. Cool. The conservation of mass for a closed system is simple. I'm not, uh, I almost didn't put this up because it almost could be considered trivial, but I do want you to be aware, so the mass in the system at the beginning, or you know, some state, in this case M1, is the same at the mass of, in the system at any other state. The change in mass, delta M is always zero, and the mass rate across the boundary of the system is equal to zero. If you've got a cycle, the cycle can be closed and it can have a mass flow rate through the system, but the mass rate across a boundary will be zero because uh, the system is closed. So that's our conservation of mass sorted out. What about our conservation of energy? That's a pity. Untag. That can... Sorry, that's my boss. Um, cool. Overall energy transfer, radio. So we, we said this uh, on Wednesday, so the energy transfer into and out of a system must equal the change of energy in the system. So if energy is coming into the system, 
and nothing's going out, the energy must increase, and vice versa. And we can do that on a rate basis as well. So I want to treat the, what, the left hand side and the right hand side of the equation separately. We'll simplify them, we'll bring them together, um, and we'll have a first law for closed systems. So how is energy transferred into or out of a system? Okay, Energy can be transferred through heat, Q, and through work, W, and it can be transferred by mass flow. So mass coming into a system can bring energy with it. Mass exiting a system will take energy out with it. Um, and so that can be something that happens. But for a closed system, there's no energy transfer associated with mass flow. There's no mass in, no mass out. So that's nice. We can cancel that off. And we would say the energy transfer in the system is Q minus W. Q is positive if heat is coming into the system. W is positive if the system is doing work on its surroundings. So there's a sign convention to be aware of there. Um, and you'll do enough problems that you'll get to uh, get used to that. And I'll just put it in brackets, there might be many heat transfers and many works as well. So it's the summation of heat transfers and of works. In the next concepts, I want to talk about, so we'll, we'll finish this, but I want to talk about Q and W define them a little more formally, um, and particularly W, work can come in many forms. So I need to be aware of them. So that's energy transfer into an outer system. What about the energy in a system? All right. What are the components for us that make up the energy within a system? We mentioned them last week, there's three of them. Two of them you've dealt with a lot in MN 1300, and one of them we care a lot about in thermodynamics. Internal energy is one of them, the other two? Kinetic, Kinetic energy potential. and potential energy. Excellent, good, good, good. Thank you. So that's three. And we'll use U to denote internal energy. We'll think about internal energy as like thermal energy, okay? EK for kinetic and EP for um, potential. So the change of energy in a system is the sum of the, the change in those three energies. Right? Um, we know what, say we take potential energy, we know what potential energy is, it's MGH. We'll use Z to denote height, because H means something else. So, but change in height. So if the system, if the mass within the system is changing elevation, then this system, in the, the energy in the system is changing. We'll find that for most of our calculations, we'll disregard potential energy. Most of the things that we're dealing with, so for example, a gas, right, a gas, you have to lift a gas a lot, like a, a quite a large elevation to have any material change in potential energy at all. You heat a gas up a few degrees C, a few, a few Kelvin, you have a large change in thermal energy. Right? So we often disregard potential energy, and a lot of our processes are taking place in tanks, turbines, things that are nominally at the same height. You don't have large changes of, uh, of elevation. That might not be true if you're dealing with a liquid. They're more dense. You've got, larger, you've got a larger mass, potentially. Kinetic energy, coming in from the right. So kinetic energy, we know what that is. Half mv squared. In this case, it's m on 2. Uh, our final velocity minus our initial velocity. So this is talking about the change in kinetic energy. Um, for some processes, we will care about the change in kinetic energy. For many processes, we won't. We'll disregard kinetic energy, and we'll see why when we do a calculation. And then, the one that we'll do all of our time on, a lot of our time on, is change in internal energy, or M times the specific change in internal energy. So lowercase here is denoting uh, specific internal energy, uppercase is denoting total internal energy of the system. Of course, all those terms have mass in them. Yeah, go. What is the change in U? U2 minus U1? Good. It's internal thermal energy as measured in kilojoules. We measure it using temperature. So you can think of that as 
a temperature increase or a temperature decrease, but different substances will uh, do temperature differently, although they'll do internal energy exactly the same. So, sorry? Yes, but we'll get there. So, yeah. Tr uh, substances don't transfer temperature between each other, they transfer energy between each other. And so we track the energy and calculate the temperature. Or we measure the temperature and calculate the energy. Um, but it's a good question, so use what we need to know. Um, mass is, of course, a, a common factor there between potential energy, kinetic energy, and also internal energy. So we can take that out and we can find the change of energy of a system in a specific basis. And if we neglect kinetic and potential energy, which we often do, and particularly for a closed system, all right, if you've got a tank or a cylinder and something's happening in it, it's not changing height materially, it's not going quickly. Um, so kinetic energy and potential energy can be disregarded then we can say that the change in energy of a system, if we disregard potential and kinetic energy, is just the change in the thermal energy of the system. All right? This is like the exact opposite of exactly the same treatment that I know Kelman gave for 1300. I was watching his uh, video on stream, but don't tell him. It's really awkward. Um, I, he's a good lecturer. I like him. Um, right? Because he, he put up this, and said, you've got thermal energy, kinetic energy, and potential energy, and then said, let's disregard thermal energy and talk about how potential energy and kinetic energy relate, right? Cool, I've just done exactly the same thing, but opposite. So I said, disregard kinetic and potential energy, we're gonna talk about thermal energy. Um, and I'll, I, can, I can show why that, uh, that is relevant for our study. Uh, and that can be on a specific basis as well. So if you divide both sides by mass, okay, so at the top, we're talking about the energy of the total system. At the bottom, we're talking about on a specific basis. So therefore, energy transfer, okay, equals Q minus W, and delta energy of the system is delta U. And you often see delta U equals Q minus W. So I, I've swapped those around and it can be on a specific basis as well. This is what we would say if someone said, write out the first law of thermodynamics for, closed, for a closed system, this is what you would write. And for the problem sets related to this, um, this, which, uh, um, this week's problem sets, or, or problem set two, uh, you would start with this equation and you'd do everything from that basis. So is everyone comfortable with how We've gone from something, I guess, a bit longer and more complicated, talking about energy transfer. We'll talk about the energy associated with mass flow later. That's got three terms in it as well. So the equation does get quite long, but we often pare it down. And we say, well, we're interested in closed systems. We've made some assumptions about um, potential and kinetic. And so we can get something with only three terms. It's awesome. Go. Excellent. Good. So the difference is between the uppercase at the top and the lowercase at the bottom is the top properties, well, properties U, um, Q and W, are extensive, so they're total on the whole system, and the bottom are specific or intensive properties, so they're on a per mass basis. So, yeah, so you could say, um, let's put a cubic meter of water here, Cool. You could say, I'm going to put a thousand kilojoules, yeah, let's do that. Let's put a, a megajoule of energy into a cubic meter of water and see how much its temperature goes up. Okay, but I'm not going to do any work to it. Okay, so I've got a Q term, heat, right? So I've put heat into the water um, and I'm looking for a delta U and W is zero. Okay? So I've got a ton of water, I'm putting a megajoule of energy in. Or the same problem on a, using the bottom is, well, I can say, I can divide everything by mass. So I've got 1,000 kilograms of water, cubic meter of water. I've got 1,000 kilograms of water, and I've got a megajoule. Let's divide a megajoule by 1,000. So I've got 
a kilojoule per kilogram. If my maths is dodgy, someone pointed out. If I've got a, I'm going to put a kilojoule per kilogram of heat into the water. What's going to happen to each kilogram of water? What, how will the temperature change? Now I'm talking about kilojoules per kilogram of heat energy, and I'm talking about kilojoules per kilogram. So I've taken it down to a specific basis. So you divide the whole system by the mass to get from total to specific. It's good, which just, it's a convention for the whole subject, so I'm okay to spend a little bit of time. So I appreciate the question. Cool. Huh. So this should be trivially easy. Just give it a read. If people on the live stream would like to ask a question, I've got, or anyone in the auditorium, you don't like to put up your hand, I've got the team's lecture, live chat, and videos open on this window. And I'll occasionally glance across to it. So you can message me. But if you're in the room, put up your hand. Cool. So on a total system basis, 10 kilojoules of work is done to compress a fluid, which then transfers 4 kilojoules as heat to the surroundings. What is the change in internal energy delta U of the fluid? What's the sign of the 10 kilojoules? Does it work? Is it positive or negative? I heard negative. Good, yes. So it's negative. So when the system does work on the surroundings, we consider that positive work. When the surroundings do work on the system, we consider that negative work. Okay, so we get 10 kilojoules is a negative W. Transfers four kilojoules of heat to the surroundings. So is that positive or negative heat transfer? I heard negative, right? So when we are transferring heat to a system, we consider that positive. When the system is transferring heat to the surroundings, we can see that negative. So we end up saying, I'll see if this is set up to do. So we say delta U equals negative 4 kilojoules, negative, negative 10 kilojoules equals, no, no one's getting out a calculator. No. <laughs> That's fine. Um, yeah? So you say, what's the change in internal energy of the fluid? So it's six kilojoules. Yeah, go. My maths is wrong. <laughs> yes? That's right. Work towards the system is negative. Work from the system is positive. Yep. And the reason for that is that when this was originally developed, they were trying to make basically a steam engine, right? So this is, this is all invented when the steam engine was um, going on. And so they were saying, we'll put heat in and we'll get work out. So heat put into the system is positive because that's what we're doing. We don't want large negative numbers right, to indicate that we're doing the right thing. So heat into the system is positive. Right? And work out of the system is what we want. So that's also a positive quantity. Right? So that's, um, that's where that sign convention comes from. But I don't mind intuiting it a little bit. Like, you're like, you know, if you did this and you got an answer of 14, you're like, I don't feel like that's right. I don't feel like I should have added the numbers. Um, hopefully. Hopefully, hopefully. We're not talking about cycles, but we will get there. And I just wanted to mention something that's really cool and will become important later, um, which is in a cycle, the fluid returns back to the state that it was in at the beginning of the cycle. Okay? So if I've got a cycle here, ah, I need some labels. All right, so as you're going from state point one to state point two, you're putting work into the system. See, the arrow is pointing towards the center of the cycle. Right, you're putting work into the system. Uh, and then as you go from state point two to state point three, you put heat into the system. This is an internal combustion engine. 
So this is an auto cycle, just for those who like to think in those terms. And then from state point three to state point four, you get work out of the system. And then from state point four to state point one, you reject heat back into the environment. You have heat lose the system, lost from the system, I'm, I'm sorry. And then when you get back to state point one, your fluid must be at the same property, has the same property values as it had at state point one, because that's the definition of a cycle. You go back to the same state point that you were at, okay? And what that means is the net amount of heat that you put into the system, ah, oh, sorry, what that means is the cyclic integral of u is equal to zero. So u delta u over the whole cycle is zero because u can't change. And so when you sum up your q's and you sum up your w's, they must equal zero, which means that the net heat that you put into the system equals the net work you get out of the system. So the heat in, um, or the, the net q equals the net w. So what we want to do to improve, if we want to improve the work out of a, a cycle, which is often our, what we're trying to optimize, what we want is work out. What we try and do is put more energy in, in step two to three, proportionally and proportionally take less energy out in step four to one. So we have, can have an optimum system if we put lots of energy in and lose less waste heat. So just to get you thinking about cycles, we'll go there later. There's some limitations on how efficient we can go um, and we'll get there. So that was the first law of closed systems. There's a few terms that we need to then talk about. We need to talk about heat, we need to talk about work, we should talk about internal energy and its relationship to temperature and so forth. Cool. Any other questions before we carry on? Go. So with the fuel gone through the system, how do you call it a closed system when you know, the fuel is obviously exploding? I just think in a very sort of practical sense. If you've got fuel exploding, how can that same fuel return to the state it began when you burn the fuel off? It's good. The question is, how can an internal combustion engine be considered a closed system when you've got your fuel changing state? Uh, yes. Let's talk about it when we talk about the auto cycle properly. Yeah, it's called a quasi-closed system. But we, we model it closed and then we allow that it's open. But yes, it's a, it's a good question. And I don't want to get too caught up because we need to learn some stuff before we get there. Great question, thank you. Good. All right, sweet. Let's talk about heat really quickly. Um, We'll talk about heat transfer in a few weeks' time, and then heat transfer will become, who does MEC 3610 next year, or this year, you know, either, but who has MEC 3610 in your program? All the standard mechanical guys do. Who doesn't have MEC 3610 in your program? Okay. If I ask two questions and they're mutually exclusive, anyway, whatever, who would, who would not put up their hand no matter what question I asked. <laughs> lying, lying. <laughs> That's fine. No worries. Who, who doesn't have MEC 3610 in the program? You don't know. That's a good answer. All right. Oh, OK, radio. Good. That's fine. I don't know what I'm doing next week. Why would I know what's in my program for next year? Doesn't matter. Um, cool. MEC 3610 is, sorry, advanced thermofluids. I know mechanical degrees do it, um, as in if you're getting a degree of mechanical engineering, you do it. I don't know whether aerospace students do it. I don't think they do. I don't think aerospace or manufacturing students do it. Um, so whatever. If you're straight mechanical, you do it. Uh, this subject used to have no heat transfer in it. I want to cover heat transfer. It becomes about half of that subject. But I feel like you should know it, even if you're an aerospace student, is how I feel. So we'll talk about heat transfer, but I just wanted to say, hey, this is heat. We'll get there later. Oh dear, dreadful. Right. Heat is the spontaneous flow of thermal energy down a temperature gradient. So heat is what happens when you've got something hot and you've got something else that's cold and they can interact somehow, right? And the hot thing loses thermal energy in the form of heat. So it has a negative heat action 
and the cold body gains thermal energy through the process of heat, so it has a positive heat action, and the heat lost from the hot body must equal the heat gained by the cold body. Okay? Um, we'll talk about the mechanisms of that and some of the governing formulas, but we won't really cover it until next year. Heat's not a property, so it's, it's worth knowing that. So this is a, a, a path variable, is what it's called. So, um, for example, in a closed cycle, Q net, it, U, you know, the, the cyclic integral of U equals zero. Whatever gains U took as it went round, it lost. You know, it had a gain, it had a loss, so that when it got back to the start, it was zero, the cyclic integral was zero. The cyclic integral of Q was not zero. You had a Q net at the end of the process. You had a W net at the end of the process. So it's not a property of the system, and we'll see it represented in kilojoules, in its extensive form, we'll see it in kilojoules per kilogram in its uh, specific form, and we'll see it on a rate basis. So you're adding, and you're familiar with that, kilowatt. You might be adding 150 kilowatt of energy. Actually, you're adding about 140 watt of energy to the room at the moment. Um, if you're sleepier, it goes more towards 100. Um, if there's no heat transfer, we call that adiabatic. In real terms, if you've got a temperature difference between, temp um, between bodies, you always have heat transfer, but we can either insulate things really well, okay, um, using things like foam, polystyrofoam, that's a great material up to about 100, 110 degrees, then it starts to melt. Asbestos is a really great material for thermal insulation and not for your health. We don't use asbestos anymore. <laughs> But oh, I'll show you a table in, in, yes. So you can use good materials. Metals are typically very conductive, ceramics less so. If we do a process fast, or we insulate it, then we can pretend like it's adiabatic. And it lets us simplify things. We can take a whole term out of our equation, and that's useful. Sign convention, we've talked about. Heat in is positive, heat, heat out is negative. Quick treatment of heat. Q. Once again, we don't use H. H is reserved for something else. Cool. Longer section on work. And because you've all done MN 1300, you know the sad part of this story is that if the truck doesn't move, the guy does no work from an engineering point of view. It's sad. All right. Cool. We'll, we'll answer this question later. I just wanted to put it up because this is the sort of thing we're talking about. All right. A cylinder of a known cross section expands by a known distance with an internal pressure of a known pressure. The pressure's not changing, so what type of process is this? Isobaric. Good. How much work is done by the system? And so that's a cylinder with a defined geometry and defined area. The volume of an irregularly shaped balloon increases by some volume. It's an isobaric process again at a known internal pressure. How much work's done by the system? So those are the, that's the sort of thing we're talking about. So we're talking about um, we've got fluid contained by some fluid boundary and the wall of the boundary is moving and we're saying what work is done by or what work is done onto the system. Work occurs when you've got force on something in motion. Right? So um, work equals Fs is probably how you've seen it. We use S for entropy, so we won't use Fs. But, uh, but that's what we're talking about. It comes in a couple of different forms. We, we'll talk about it in terms of kilojoules, total energy, specific energy, kilojoules per kilogram, and work on a rate basis. So again, kilowatts. So it has the same units as heat, which is useful because we're plussing and minusing them. When you try and minus things with different units, it's hard. Sign convention, we've talked about. It's not followed all the time. Cool. The path taken matters. So our elevation is a, is a property, okay? So 
I came from my office. I walked down to get here. You guys might have come from the bus. You, you know, come up or whatever, or on the level to get here. We're all at the same elevation, um, so that's a property. Work is not a property. It's dependent on the path you took. So the work that I expended to get here might be different to the work that you expended to get here. Um, now, let's just go through this. So work equals fs, okay? And so a small amount of work equals a force over a small amount of distance. But if we're dealing with fluids and they're bearing on an area, you know that the force on the area is the pressure times the area, okay? Or pressure is force divided by area. So from that, force is pressure times area. So therefore, we can substitute pressure area into here. But area dx, sorry where the cursor is, area dx, if you sweep an area through a small change in distance, then you sweep out a volume. Okay? So area dx equals dv. And so the amount of work you do is equal to the pressure in the system times by the change in volume of the system. And if we have some way of integrating that, we can say the work done to get from state 1 to state 2 is equal to integral from 2 to 1, or 1 to 2, however you read that, of pressure dv. Okay? So if, and if pressure's not dependent, if pressure's not a function of, uh, of the path you're taking, it can come out of the integral as well. This is the maximum min in, max out. If you're getting work f from a system, this is the maximum amount of work you can get from the system. So, and if you're putting work into a system, this is the minimum amount of work you need to put in to achieve this, this change. So you'll get um, slight hysteresis losses in your materials, you'll get friction. Um, just trying to think about some other effects that might, might be occurring. Um, but if you want to achieve some compression, you need to put this amount of work in or a little bit more. And if this is work that you're getting into your surroundings, you'll get this amount of work or a little bit less. Um, entropy works the other way. Let's have a look at this. Oh no. What I want to do is open that. Open. That's a pity. And because I've got such a small resolution, I can't see what I want to see. Aha! Work. Let's talk about work. So, let's increase pressure and increase volume. So if we start at state one, and we go to state two, all right, and I've got two cylinders here. We're going to have a piston resting on some stops. And it's going to be constrained at the top with some stops. And we're going to do the same thing over here. Have a piston resting on some stops. Now, let's do that. Cool. Uh, there's two thoughts. What we're going to end up with is the piston at the top with a mass sitting on it. All right? So we're going to start at the same initial state, and we're going to finish at the same end state. Right? But we're going to take two different paths. In the, in the blue path, okay, we'll call that a blue. In the blue path, right, we'll keep the pressure low. We'll add the mass after the cylinder's lifted. Okay? So the pressure is going to stay low, as the volume increases, and then we're going to hit the stop, and then we're going to continue increasing the pressure until we reach state two, and that's enough pressure to hold this mass at the top. All right? But in the green state, we're going to put the weight on first, we're going to put the mass on first, and so the cylinder will stay on the bottom stops as the pressure increases, 
pressure will increase to the point that there's enough pressure to lift the mass up and then the volume will increase until it hits the stops at the top. Okay? And what I wanted to point out is that if you had a snapshot of this at the initial state, right? So I should have done. That's final. And nope. That's final. Okay, so if you had a snapshot of the initial states and their final states, state one and state two, you would say, okay, their state properties are all the same. And in fact, the temperature needs to rise in order for this to happen. You need to add uh, heat into the cylinders to get them to, uh, rise their to raise their pressure. Right? But the work done is, and we know work equals the integral of PDV, okay? The work done is the area under this curve because that's what integral means, right? Area under the curve. And the work done by the <coughs> cylinder on the right is the area under that curve. So the cylinder on the right's done more work and in fact has had to have more heat added to it than the cylinder on the left. Okay, so that's talking about how work is a path dependent variable and not independent like the properties of the states are. Is that okay? Yeah, go. Good. So what, what the difference is, is on the blue one, on the green one, I'm adding the weight first. Adding weight first. And on the blue one, I'm adding the weight afterwards. Or not at all. Because the piston's up against the stops anyway. So the weight isn't doing anything to move the piston. Yeah, yeah. Would the same amount of energy be put into the system either way though? In different forms or not? The internal energy, yeah, the, the internal energy is the same at the at the final state. Yeah. But no, you need more heat put into the system to achieve the, the thing on the right. Yeah. And it's so this is counterintuitive, and that's why it's that's why we're learning, I guess. So you've got delta U equals Q minus W. The cylinder on the right is doing more work. So it's having a higher negative quantity there, so it needs a higher positive quantity Q. Right? So we could put like a uh, a candle or a Bunsen burner. Put a flame under here to add some heat. So work. Work quite good. Excellent. Go. That's right. You're yes. No, that's true. Yep, so on the system on the right, the system's lifting the weight. On the one on the left, you've added elevation to the weight at the beginning of the process. So yes. Yep, that's, and that's the difference. So what you need to add in heat on the right, you need to add as, as uh, mechanical energy on the left. Yeah. Anyway, just, I don't know, just raising up the two things there. One, the fact that the work is the integral of the curve under a PV chart, and two, that it's path dependent, not independent. So it's, you can't calculate the state knowing only, you can't calculate the work knowing only the state points. You must know the path that you um, took to get between one state and the other.
So we've got a couple of different processes. These aren't the only processes. These aren't the only ways to get from one state point to another. But these are a couple of standard ones. Um, and we should be able to almost trivially do isobaric and isochoric. I'll show you the calculation for polytropic and then show you the solution to isentropic and isothermal in terms of work done for these processes to get from state one to state two. You guys okay to do some math? We'll do this and then we'll, um, we will have a break. But that doesn't mean, doesn't mean stop paying attention, it means pay attention sharply for the next few moments. Isochoric, what's isochoric mean again? No change in volume. If a process is isochoric, what's the boundary work? What's the work associated with a moving boundary? Zero? Cool. So if you have dv, I've put the formula up in the top right hand corner. If dv is zero, okay, because it's isochoric, volume doesn't change as a function of process or time, then this integral goes to zero. So you don't get work in an isochoric space. So moving boundary work. We'll talk about some other types of work, but they're simpler. This is the, this is the work we need to calculate. Isobaric work. So isobaric work is where the pressure is constant. So pressure P is constant. If pressure P is constant, it can move in front of the integral and you just get the integral of V between state point one and two. Okay, so for isobaric work, hopefully it's work one to two equals pressure V2 minus V1. Okay, uh, hopefully that's fairly trivial for, in terms of the integra integration. The rest take a little bit of manipulation. So I want to show you polytropic. Um, it's in the slides for your future perusal. And this is what it looks like. I'm going to turn around and look this way. So we start off with our, our governing equation, the integral of PDV. And we know that for a polytropic process, P V to the N equals C. That's our definition for polytropic processes. And so we substitute that in. We make P the subject of the equation. And we substitute that in and we get P equaling, or our integral equaling C V to the N dV, which is good. So now we're integrating volume with respect to volume. So it feels like we're going to be able to do that. Uh, the C is, of course, constant, so it can come out the front. Uh, this integral, right, we, when we integrate, we add 1 to the index and then divide by the resulting index. So we get this is the result of the index. That only works when n doesn't equal 1. So when n equals 1, you get the integral of 1 on v, dv. And what's the form of the integral of 1, one on v, dv? Man, so much maths. Sorry? Logarithm? Yep. So the natural log of V. So we're going to see a natural log occur when n equals 1. So excluding the n equals 1 case, we get this between 1 and 2. So we can substitute those in. So we've got volume 2 minus volume 1. Okay? But we've got this C in here, which is just a dummy variable we've introduced. If we substitute those Cs back in, C equals P. 1 v1 to the n equals p2 v2 to the n. Uh, and then we can get the bottom line. So we've, we've done some substitution. All right. We've, I've just copied the bottom line to the top line of this page. All right. But then we've got a v to the n times a v to the 1 minus n. So it feels like they can be added together. Indices can be added if you're multiplying. And we get p2 v2 minus p1 v1 divided by 1 and n. So if you know the pressure and volume of state 1, you know the pressure and volume of state 2, you know the polytropic index, n, and you know that you got there in a polytropic manner, then you can calculate the work. Yeah, go. Um, is this just for ideal gases? Is this just for ideal gases? Yes, it is. 
Yeah, it is for ideal gases. Uh, pure substances don't behave in a polytropic manner. Yep. So that's, that's a good point. For work for others, yeah, you have to integrate PDV. So that's our formula for polytropic work. Now, if you know pressure one and volume one, so you know the state one, you know the polytropic index N, and you know something about where it's going to end up, either the pressure or the volume, you can, of course, calculate the thing you don't know based on this equation here. So if you know the volume doubles and N equals 1.2, then you can calculate the pressure too. Sorry, my apologies. So, and you can find the work done in the process. Now, if the process is isentropic, therefore, then N equals K, right? So we just replace the N with a K and we get what's on the bottom left. So that's nice and easy. If the process is isothermal, okay, so with isothermal processes, because we know PV divided by T is constant, if T itself is constant, then we find that P times V is constant, which is this, where N equals 1. So we find that we do get a natural logarithm, as you correctly said, and we find this equation in the bottom right. There you go. What are the powers of N and K? What are the powers of N and K? The N is the polytropic index, and K is the specific heat ratio, which we'll talk about now after the break. Um, it's a property of the fluid. So K you'll find will be a property of the fluid and will a process will be follow the form PV to the K is a constant if it's an isentropic process with an ideal gas. If it's isentropic or adiabatic with an ideal gas, it'll be PV to the power of K equals C. If it's an ideal gas under compression or expansion and it's not adiabatic or isentropic, it'll be PV to the N equals C, and you'll be given a, a polytropic index. If, if N is the polytropic index, yep. it's just 1 in the following slide. Yep. What is the real world meaning of that? No worries. Good. So if N is 1, what's the real world meaning of that? No worries. So I've got to, I just want to. I just want to explain it well. Okay. Adiabatic means no heat transfer. Okay, so say you're compressing. So we take some ambient air. I've got some air. I'll put it in a cylinder. And now I'm going to compress it. All right? I like motorbikes. Compression ratio of 18, because that's just silly. Um, so we're going to compress it 18 times down its volume. If I allowed no heat to escape, or I did it really quickly, Okay, so heat transfer takes time. If I did it really quickly, then you would find that you'd have some pressure and some volume initially. PV to the power of, in this case, is going to be K because it's adiabatic. So PV to the power of 1.4 will equal something. I know what my volume is after that. It's V2, it's V2 is V1 divided by 18. I've got a compression error of 18. I can calculate my final pressure based on PV. Now it's a much smaller number to the power of 1.4 equals the same constant, pressure must be much higher. Sorry, I'm doing math, which is a written language in my head. I'm saying PV, in this case, to the power of K equals C. If C is to remain constant and volume goes down by a factor of 18, right? V2 equals V1 D of 18, then pressure must go up. And in fact, P2, must be greater than P1 times 18 in that case because of this K equals 1.4, right? Oops, sorry. So that's, that's your adiabatic case. If you had a real world case, what you're actually expecting, and it's also getting hotter, but there's, there's it has to get hotter because PV on T is also equaling a constant. Different constant, okay? So P times V divided by T is also equaling a different constant. So therefore, if V is going down a little bit, P is going up a lot, then T has to go up as well to maintain this constant. So that's fun. 
Um, so the gas is getting hotter. If you're losing some heat to the environment though, what you'll find is K won't be 1.4. It'll now become N. Ooh, can I do this? Yes, I can. It'll now become N and it'll be a little bit less than 1.4. If you do the process so slowly and you surround the metal casing in like liquid water or something, right, at ambient temperature, what you'll find is that all the heat escapes and you'll find that N will equal 1, so it will tend to 1, then P times V to the power of 1, P times V will equal a constant. And in fact, you'll see that come out here where PV is a constant the temperature must not change. So if n, is, if n is equal to K, you've got an isentropic process, there's no heat transfer, that's what that means. As n tends from K towards 1, the process is becoming less efficient, you're getting more heat transfer out. As n equals 1, you've got your minimally efficient process, all of the heat is lost, the temperature doesn't change. Um, and what we care about, so we're talking about a cylinder, so what we're just about to do is burn fuel to get it to be hot. So as much hot as it is already, oh, look at me, I should lecture thermodynamics with language like that. Um, the hotter it is already, the less fuel you need to get it hot. So any heat you've lost to the environment um, during that process, and isothermal would be horrible, you've, you've lost all your effective heat, you need to add more fuel to then get it up to temperature. So, that's what n equals 1 means. So you'll find n will traverse between 1 and, and k. 1 means isothermal, lost all the heat generated. k would mean adiabatic, no heat. You can get n's above 1 if you had heat coming into the system. Uh, yes, that would be that. Did that? Good, excellent, thank you. I, I really appreciate the question. Because I, I, I clarify things better when questions are asked, go. You look like you were just about to ask a question. No, okay, no worries, good. You're just looking intently interesting. Okay, interested. Don't scratch your nose. I'll point to you. Radio. I said we'd have a break, so let's do that. And let's come back with a couple of questions about boundary work. <laughs>